Well, good morning, everybody. And welcome to another Kenny Brown Cars and Coffee. I'm Kenny Brown, obviously. And over the next hour or so, we're going to be talking about some really good questions you got sent in. Uh, this is sort of like a question and answer day. So if you've got questions, any questions, send them in. And I'll do the best I can to answer them because we've got some pretty good questions this week from the uh, Speed Therapy Society group. Uh, also, I don't know where you are, but here in Indianapolis, it's an absolutely gorgeous day. And I can't get, wait to get outside and, and enjoy it. Uh, I wish, wish I had my, my car wasn't in the uh, I'll, I'll figure out something. I, I got to get outside and enjoy this day in a car somewhere. I know exactly what I'm going to do. That, that's another story. So anyway, welcome again. Uh, please send in questions. Uh, this is sort of like question day, Q&A day, because some of the questions that I got this week on Speed Therapy Society, uh, I'd like to like spend a little time on uh, so that, uh, uh, anyway, anyway, they're good questions. And if you have any more questions, send them in. Uh, unfortunately, I'm here by myself this morning. Uh, Carrie is at home uh, recuperating from a, a little bit of a back problem. Uh, but she's going to be here in spirit, and also she's going to be in the background. She's got a little computer set up at home, and she's going to help me with the question and answers when we get to that point. So let's see. As far as, far as well, let's see Rory's here, Cliff's here, Calvin's here. Uh, I don't know which question to start with. Uh, okay, I'm going to start with, with P.T. Perry's question. His question is, uh, what is the proper, the best way to warm up a track car? That's a really good question because, it, if, yeah, it's a good question because if you don't take time to get your, everything warmed up, uh, you could find yourself in a bit of a pickle. So the very first thing, before you even pull out in line, get the car warmed up in the pits, up to operating temperature. You want the car at operating temperature because you want the oil up at operating temperature. That's the most important thing. So get the car warmed up when it's still in the pits. When you go out on track, uh, depends on which session of the day it is. Uh, in, the, the fur, in the morning session, the first session in the morning, I'd take my time, you know, find my way around the track, see what's going on, and slowly bring your tires and brakes and yourself up to temperature because you head out on the track, your tires are cold, your brakes are cold, you're cold. So take the first lap or so just to get, kind of get everything warmed up and, and then then you can start uh, playing around. Look, like I tell people, my first session on a Saturday morning, I spend completely working on tire temperatures, getting my tire temperature, my tire pressure set because once I got my tire pressures down, you know, my car my car is really, really fast. But that tire temperatures and pressures is such an important part. So, I mean, it's basically the best way, just carefully, uh, you know, don't, don't go out just balls to the wall. You know, take your first lap at, say, 60, 70 percent, next lap at 80 percent. And then by then you should have, depending on the day and depending on the tires you've got, uh, you should have everything warmed up and ready to go. Uh, if uh, I've, I've seen too many times people get too excited, they forget to warm up a car and they just get the red mist. You know, in, in, uh, in, in motorsports, we have an expression called the red mist. Uh, and it's something that kind of takes hold of people that they have no control over. And you can imagine, imagine what I mean. But I, I've seen it more than once. Uh, people get all jacked up. They're, re they're really ready to go. They're excited. They jump in their car. Bam, they hit the gas pedal. And before you know it, the first lap, they're in, 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 the, in the weeds or in the guardrail somewhere. So that's, that's a good question because you really need to get everything warmed up. Remember, it's your brakes, your tires, and yourself because you're hitting the track cold, too. And always warm up your engine and get your oil temperature oil up to temperature before you go out. Uh, that's the best way to save the motor. So, okay, here, here's uh, Dale has another interesting question. Uh, Dale says, how about S197 pinion angle uh, for a lowered car for street and track? Okay, that's, that's, that's a really good question because pinion, pinion angles are important. But when you lower a car, basically, I mean, the, the way the, the, Control arms are set up in the back of the car, the long and short one, and they're designed in such a way so the, the rear axle basically moves straight up and down, you know, mostly straight up and down, but it doesn't move around a lot. So when you lower the car, it shouldn't really change the pinion angle. But if you want to change the pinion angle of a lowered car, this is how you do it. And unfortunately, you have to pull the uh, drive shaft out. That's the only way to do it right. 
The first thing you do is you check the angle of the motor. And if you've got an angle gauge, typically if the drive shaft's out, you go right on the, on the butt end of the, the output shaft of the transmission and check and see what the angle is. Typically, that's about two, two, two and a half degrees downward, even three degrees downward. So if the engine, engine angle is downward, then your pinion angle needs to be upwards. So you do the same thing. You put your, your angle gauge on the, on the pinion, on the front of the pinion, and that should be opposite. If you're two degrees down in the, in the, at the engine, the uh, axle should be two degrees up. So what you're looking for is kind of a zigzag. If you had them both perfectly level, then you get kind of a, a jump rope thing. If they're both pointing the same way, you get jump rope. So to keep from getting a jump rope and massive vibration, you just stagger them. I mean, that's the way they're engineered. So two degrees up, two degrees down, or two degrees down, two degrees up, <clears> or <throat> three degrees down, three degrees up. Uh, so it's, it's easy to check. Uh, it's best if you just take, if you do pull the drive shaft out, and so you can get right on the back of the, uh, the transmission, right on the output shaft, so you know that the angle's true. Because there's, there's other surfaces on there that might not be 100% uh, true. So that's that. And also, you know, we always use aluminum drive shafts uh, and S197s, and pretty much everything. Uh, on the S197, they come with a two-piece factory, a two-piece uh, drive shaft. And I mean, they're, it's, a, it's a great piece uh, for, for an OE car. But, you know, from our perspective, you know, from a performance perspective, they're heavy. Uh, they're heavy, and there's an extra joint in the middle which can create friction, and, you know, we just pull them out and throw them away and put in a really good, have to use a good quality aluminum uh, drive shaft. I know other people use carbon drive shafts. Uh, I haven't been a fan of those, although because we've had problems in the past, but I'm sure that they made, they've made big improvements on the on carbon drive shafts in the last, uh, say, five years or so. But we've I think Paul a long time ago had a car carbon drive shaft, and uh, it didn't break. It exploded. And the, the, the biggest piece was about that big. I mean, it just vaporized. So that was probably, gosh, it had to be like 10 or 15 years ago. So I'm sure the carbon ones are better now. But either way, carbon or aluminum, uh, it takes a lot of rotating mass out, uh, which will let the car rev, rev freer. So pinion angle, aluminum drive shaft. And if you do aluminum drive shaft, it's really important that you get the pinion angle right because you don't want – the, the whole idea of that double that double drive shaft is reduce the vibration because the drive shaft so long. So if that's gone, you got one piece drive shaft. You really need to make sure you got your pinion angle right. So that's uh, that's uh, uh, that's actually that was Dale's question. Uh, okay, Andrew uh, wants to know: Do stock four six three valve engines need a baffled oil pan if I want to try autocross or tracks such as Pocono or VIR? I would say, yes, uh, we put uh, road race oil pans on every single car that we do. Uh, it's just, it's an insurance policy. I mean, it's just the, the, the what's different about a road race oil pan uh, and is the fact that they're obviously a little bigger, they hold more oil, but where the pickup is, there's little, little like fences all around where the pickup is with little one-way trap doors. So as the car would go through a corner and the oil would slosh, it would be able to slosh into the little, little pickup area, but because the trap door won't slosh out. And the other way, it'll slosh in but not slosh out. That way, you've always got oil uh, being picked up. If you don't, I mean, there's a chance that if you, if you don't have a good oil pan going through a corner really fast, getting the oil is kind of like going right up the side of the pan in the engine. And if, you're, if your uh, oil pump is sucking air, uh, that's a catastrophe. I can tell you that for a fact, because you mentioned Pocono. Okay, I had a very interesting experience at Pocono a number of years ago. We were, I was there doing a, a segment for uh, Motor Week uh, with uh, the Red Rocket, which is my 96 Cobra, the supercharged Cobra that was, was a really fast car. And uh, we blew the engine up uh, at, the, at, at Pocono. And you know, in the forensic analysis, what had happened is coming down, I mean, you come right around really fast on, on the on the oval, and then you dive down into the infield. And it, it's a pretty hard breaking and turning. And uh, based on what we found in the engine when we took it apart and talking to the engineers up at Ford, what happens is 
the uh, the oil in, in the stock. This was with a stock oil pan. In a stock oil pan, the oil under hard braking will slosh up to the front of the pan, and once it gets there, the timing chain becomes an extremely efficient oil pump, and it just throws all the oil out of the oil pan up in the top of the motor. So, and that's what happened. I mean, you do that a couple of times to suck air and boom, you know, it was, the rods went out. So yeah, at Road Race Oil Pan, we've, we we used the Cantons, had really, really good luck with them. Uh, I, think, I don't know if we've got one on, on the website right now. I asked Brad to put one up. I think they're the, uh, uh, the Road Race Oil Pan for a 4.6, I think it's around 420 bucks. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot cheaper than a motor. Uh, and that way you, you've got insurance that you're going to have oil pressure. So, yeah, I, I'd strongly recommend anybody that does a lot of track days. I strongly recommend a road race oil pan. Uh, it's just insurance. You know, it's a, it's a cheap insurance policy. So, okay, that's for the oil pan. Uh, and then I'm, I'm sure that uh, if you check in a day or so that we'll have that up on the website. And if not, just call it a rich. We can get you fixed up. Another thing when you change oil pans on the, any of the modular motors, on the brand new cars, because we do a lot of like brand new, brand new cars, uh, we'll reuse the oil the oil pan gasket because it's it's pretty fresh. But <clears throat> something like a three six on a four six, uh, <clears throat> you need to get a fresh oil pan gasket, <clears throat> and they're kind of like a, the big a one piece thing, and it's just another good insurance. I mean, there's nothing worse than spending all the time to put a, a good oil pan on, not change the gasket, and then find yourself you got a little oil leak so you always want to get an oil pan gasket when you change the oil pan too okay her store has got a couple here uh, it's, it's first I got to read the first one the first one's kind of big uh, if, if you're just joining us I'm Kenny Brown this is cars and coffee this is kind of Q&A day so please if you've got questions send them in I'll do the best I can to answer them right now we're answering questions from uh, the uh, Speed Therapy Society website and the Kenny Brown Performance website. So send send your uh, send your 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 cards and letters in. So this I got this is kind of a long one, so I'm going to read it to you. So this is Herstor. He's in uh, Bulgaria. Uh, he was one of our Speed Therapy Academy guys, and he got up at two o'clock every morning uh, to attend the academy in in the first session. Okay, so he says I went to the track on Friday the fifth. Uh, however, for some reason, my car looks like it's down on power on the straight. I only reached 171.9 kilometers, which is 107 miles an hour. And the temperature was 22 Celsius, which is 72 Fahrenheit. Uh, and back in November, he reached 179, uh, which is 110 miles an hour. And the near temperature was 11 Celsius, which is 52 degrees. So, I mean, there's, there's a big difference in, in temperature, uh, you know, 52 to 72 is 20 degrees temperature. And he's missing like, what, uh, three miles an hour? I mean, it's, it's not a lot. He said, I did reach uh, 179 in my first session on Friday, but after, the temps went, but after the temps went down. Also, before one of the sessions, the car was rough idle and even shut down. I guess something overheated, but I didn't see any error codes. And the cylinder head temperature never got north of 235. Uh, it was also the first time he'd driven on track with race mode. Uh, and, he, and race mode, not as usual, sport mode. So maybe he overloaded the traction lock diff. No, nah, you wouldn't overload the traction lock diff. That's that's kind of a whole different territory. Uh, it's it, You know, cars do funny things. Uh, and if it, if, if it ran idle and sh and shut down uh, first thing i do is make sure that all the vacuum lines are connected and something didn't come off because i mean a vacuum a vacuum leak you know pre uh pre throttle body even in the in intake manifold can really throw everything askew uh, sometimes you know everything just kind of wasn't happy uh, i'm sure that if you shut it down and turn it up and start it up again it'll be it'll be good but as far as the you know the speed i mean I tell people every track, every day, every driver, every car is different. Uh, I'm gonna give you a really good example. And to me, I think it's, it's a difference in temperature. Uh, it's kind of a weird trade off because when it's cooler, air is denser and you're making more power. In the same token, the air is denser, the molecules are together and it takes more power to push through the air. So it's kind of a trade off, but usually it, it's the, the cooler temperatures is more favored of making power 
than as, as far as uh, uh, airflow over the car. But I mean, it's three miles an hour uh, difference down from, from 52 degrees to 72 degrees. Uh, I'll give you a, a good example, first, a firsthand experience. Uh, when we were doing the Celine program, this is in 87, uh, we were at Brainerd. And we did the normal, you know, Thursdays, Promoter's Day, which we do all our testing. And, you know, we got the cars pretty, I mean, we spent the whole day, got, got all the cars you know, pretty much dialed in. And so the next morning, Friday, in the first practice session, uh, I mean, we were off by maybe a second and a half. I mean, it was, it was pretty noticeable, at least a second and a half. And Steve was just going ballistic. I mean, he just wouldn't know what happened. He's just gone crazy. And, you know, I, I you know, tried, I got them settled down. I went up and I got the timing sheets uh, for the session and I held it up and put it in his face. I said, take a look. And everybody else was down two, at least two seconds. We were only down a second and a half. So all of a sudden he calmed down and went away. So the, you know, the thing is, you know, day to day, it was that much different track. It was like a second and a half difference between Thursday and Friday. So, I mean, three miles an hour between, uh, 52 degree day and a 72 degree day. Yeah, I, I don't think there's a big issue. Uh, you know, certainly you can plug in and, and run, have a scanner run through the motor and see if anything's amiss. But I, I don't see where that's you know, kind of a very big problem. Uh, so, and as far as the, the idle, that, that's just probably a one-time thing. I'm guessing that after you started it up, it was it ran good. So that, that's kind of that. And uh, you know, as far as the, the uh, load on the, on the traction lock dip. Now, if it's cool, if it's running cool, uh, if it's not overheating, it's not a problem. I would keep an eye out though for overheating light because IRS cars will overheat the diffs pretty, pretty readily uh, because there's no, no way for the heat, nothing for nowhere for the heat to go. Now, in a live axle, you got this great big, huge chunk and massive, massive uh, uh, steel in the tubes and everything that absorb heat and, you know, put heat off. Well, in a IRS, you got this little teeny aluminum pumpkin and it's mounted in rubber. So there's no place for the heat to go because the differential and, and traction control, traction, uh, and, it, and it's, you know, will create a lot of heat. Uh, you know, the, the, like the, the torsions, there's a lot of gears and they're, they're making friction and making heat. And in the clutch type of differential, uh, they're making heat. So there's a lot of heat that gets generated in, in, a, in a differential that needs to go someplace. The live axle will kind of get spread out. Although I will say for, for track days, you know, we really don't worry about cooling the, the differential. It's really like 20 minute sessions. But for a race car, world challenge cars, absolutely we have to have a diff cooler in the back because I mean, we run a, run a piss out of those cars for 45, 50 minutes straight. And it gets hot, so we need to cool that. We also put a cooler on the transmission. So, but in a, uh, on a on an IRS car, you can overheat that diff pretty quickly. And I think on, on the newer ones, you can actually get a little, they got, uh, they got a temperature probe in there and they throw a light on the dash. Go, ah, the differential's hot. So uh, I don't think it's a differential. I think it's just a difference in, you know, three degrees, uh, or 20 degrees difference in three miles an hour. I, I don't see that as, as a big thing. Now, Hertzsper has another question that is, it's, it's another really good question. He says, uh, what is my opinion on octane boosters? Okay, well, first of all, I, I don't use them and haven't for years. And, you know, the, the, my first question is, why do you want, why do you think about using octane booster? Now, remember, we, when we talk about track cars or race cars, if we're going to do something different, we're going to make a change, but we're, we're making a change because we're looking for a specific outlook. So if you're looking for a specific outlook, you know, what's the purpose of the octane booster? Uh, because the systems, the systems are pretty much, you know, they, they run themselves as far as the engine management. Uh, and they'll figure out if it's, you know, what, uh, what octane it is, but, and, and it'll adjust the timing accordingly. Uh, you know, the, the only time I would see that somebody would even think about something like an octane boost would be if it's a, if it's a turbocharged motor, supercharged motor, and they're not sure of the quality of the gas. That being said, uh, I've heard a lot of mixed reports over the years on additives. I mean, the, you know, it's, it, you know, at marketing is marketing, advertising is advertising. Uh, that they, you know, they're trying to sell product. And 
I like I say, I've had I've heard mixed results. Uh, I think the the one I've heard that maybe is pretty good starts with T like torque or torque or something like that. I can't remember. But when you ask that question, I remember something that I read and I spent a little time, uh, more time than I wanted to uh, yesterday, uh, trying to find a little article that I found that I read on specifically on uh, additives, uh, performance additives. And it was written by somebody at Sunoco. And okay, fingers crossed, I'm gonna try to bring this document up. Uh, we practiced it and Okay, I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. Okay, fuel tips. What's really in the additive? Now, this is by uh, somebody at Sunoco, and you know, when we we I don't use octane boosters. I just go get better gas. Uh, you know, Sunoco's got a really nice uh, selection of, uh, of race gases. I think the GT is what we use. I think it's like 90, 98 octane unleaded, and that seems to work for everything. Uh, we use that in uh, like in, in, in Roy's car, which actually has a it's, a it's a Daytona prototype engine, so it's running a lot of compression. And uh, but that gas seems to work really good for everything. Anyway, here's what he says: How do you know it's really in fuel additives uh, at every auto parts store? Read the safety data sheet, uh, usually easily found online. Section three will list the product composition. And we took a deeper look at a popular full treatment aimed at the enthusiast market. Uh, that's one of probably many. And uh, the promise was uh, uh, too hard to ignore. Increased power, more torque, cleaner injectors, reduced emissions. A uh, 16-ounce bottle was $11. Treat one tank of gas. The, the SDS, that's the, the, uh, the data. Or is it up here somewhere? Uh, Safety data sheet it says the product's main ingredient listed uh, to range from two thirds to three quarters is a blend of a phatic and aromatic hydrocarbon C2 to C20. Sounds exotic. He said that's gasoline. Uh, uh, most likely being used as a solvent for the additive. This is ingredient is fluff. Nothing special about the gasoline to help treat fuel. The fuel additive uh, under our virtual microscope also contains 20% to 30% three oxa one hep hepatol, another exotic sounding compound. Uh, quick research in the CAS number, it, specific codes assigned to every chemical substance reveals that it's just a relatively non-volatile, inexpensive solvent, also known as Butyl oxyethylene or butyl glycol, uh, an eight ounce jug, roughly a gallon, retails for about 20 bucks. The final ingredient listed comprises of more than no more than 5% in the 16 ounce can, glycerized mixed. They can, they can uh, I'm, I'm killing these words, but that's okay. They can uh, octanol. Uh, the CAS number quickly reveals that the, the composition in question, the glycerized or fatty acid. Fatty acid chains that are used in many consumer products, including soaps and cosmetics. He also explained that like, uh, it's likely used here as an emulsifier that allows the polar and nonpolar chemicals to stay mixed together. Uh, it also helps <coughs> keep dirt suspended in the solution. So, you know, do the math. $11 fuel additive contains about 20 cents worth of gasoline and 75 cents worth of a common industrial solvent. Uh, then less than an ounce of an emulsifier. Uh, now his, his thing is, or he could just buy decent race gas. So there, uh, I'm gonna have I'm gonna have uh, I, I made a PDF of that. I'm gonna have Brad post that up in the uh, in the resource section for the uh, in the speed therapy uh, society. So I mean, there's I mean, I, I guess the moral of the story is if you're looking at it. You, research, see what's in it, uh, see if it really does something. I know at, at one point, a lot of the, uh, the so-called additives uh, had like diesel in them just to make the, the gas heavier. The, the thing about octane is, is like when you've got like a high compression engine uh, and you use like regular gas is like 87 octane. If you've got a high compression engine and you're running 87 uh, octane, what's going to happen is it's going to, under compression, 
it's gonna it's gonna fire early. It's you know detonation. It's firing before it's it's the the, uh, it, the the gas is exploding before the spark goes off. That's called detonation. And what happens is they have you know lead used to be in gas just a heavy metal uh, to slow down the burn. So you get the full compression before it explodes. So in, in a lot of cases, I mean, the, like years and years ago, there was like mostly diesel in, in like the the treat the, the uh, gas treatment because you know it's it's a heavier it's a heavier solvent uh, and it would slow down the burn so you don't get you don't get uh, pre ignition uh, from from the not enough octane. So I mean, it, in moral of the story, I mean, I just I, I rather than using an octane booster, I, I find some place that has some decent race gas. And it wouldn't take a lot of race gas mixed with a regular gas to increase the uh, increase the octane. Uh, but like I say, I mean, you need to be looking for a specific outcome. I mean, you, if if you are like on the dyno tuning and you wanted to, you know, put, put more timing in, you might be run a higher octane gas and then tune it to that gas. Uh, but aside from just putting an octane booster in a car that's not supercharged, you know, I, I don't know that there's a lot of value to that. Uh, and as you can see from uh, from from an expert, uh, it it could be more fluff, uh, more fluff than uh, than really good stuff. Okay, well I think uh, oh my God, Carrie isn't here, but I got notes. I got notes. Uh, let's see, we're on. Uh, let's see some thumbs up. You know, cars and coffee on on. on let's see, no, she's not here to tell me. Thumbs up on Facebook uh, and also on uh youtube likes thumbs up oh you um, are just blowing that ken <laughs> well you're, you're not here yeah well so if you like what you're hearing uh if you want to give uh kenny some thumbs up on facebook and also if you're uh we are also uh, uh simulcasting live on youtube on the kenny brown performance tv channel so uh subscribe to our channel and click the bell if you'd like to get a uh, reminder every week when he kenny is live well, there we have it. Even though she's not here, she's still here. <clears throat> so that, that kind of that's the questions I had written down so far. Uh, so, Carrie, have we got any questions that have come in? Uh, we sure do. And uh, did you answer the one on the? Uh, I can't remember. I think there's one question that you missed. No, there's there's a first to first uh, speed thing. There's the octane booster. Uh, P.T. Perry wanted to know how to properly warm up a track car. Dale wanted to know about the pinion angle. And Andrew okay. wanted to know about the uh, oil pan. Okay, that's that's it. I must have missed the um, pinion angle one. Okay, so. I, I got you. <laughs> you sure did. Here's our first question. Uh, Jason Rowe, what is a good way to find out uh, what tire pressure is needed for your car? I see people with chalk marks on their tires. Okay, you see anybody put chalk marks on their tires? Turn away. Turn away and walk away. Uh, they have no idea what they're doing. Tire pressure is really, really important. And this is this is for a, for a track day or anything else. You, the only way to do it is to get a parameter. Uh, and as luck would have it, I've always got one handy because we talk about tire temp, temp pressures a lot. You need to get yourself a parameter. I'll get this plugged in. Okay, you need to have one that's got a, if you can see the little probe, it's itsy bitsy teeny little probe, there it is. Because what you want to do is we want to get, this is one we use because I, I like these because the numbers are really big and easy to read, even in the sun. Uh, the only way to really do it is to, you want to check your tire temperatures. And that's you take the probe and you stick an inch in from the outside in the middle and an inch in from the inside. And just you know, briefly what you're looking for is to balance balance that, uh, those temperatures all the way across. If the, the, the middle is higher than the other two, then there's too much air. If the middle is lower, there's not enough air. Uh, but you're never gonna get even across, like on, on the fronts, they'll never be the same. So let's say you got 120 degrees on the outside, 100 degrees on the inside, you want 110 in the middle. That's the best way to, I mean, that's the only way to adjust your tire pressure. Uh, as far as starting pressures on, on my car, 
uh, with the uh, with the, with the, the probably PCR courses. I typically would start, depending on the day, and I kind of make my mind up the day, uh, anywhere between like 32, 33 front and 20 to 29 rear. And then in the first session, we work on the temperatures and and get the uh, the tires bled down. I like to start a little bit higher. It's easier to take air out in the pit lane than just to put air in. Uh, but I'll I'll make maybe even two stops during the, the first session and do the tire pressures real ch- real quick. So because once I get them done, it's a way to go. So I mean the yeah and and don't that whole chalk thing. <clears throat> all that tells you <clears throat> is if 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 the, if the tires rolling over eating up the chalk. It doesn't tell you what what's happening on the middle of the inside of the tire. Uh, I don't know where they, who came up with that, but somebody think everybody thinks it's pretty clever, and it, it, says, it tells you nothing. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's here. Here's the thing: they might be putting air in if if the, if it's getting on the chalk mark. They might be putting air in, uh, so it won't go in the chalk mark. When in reality, they don't have enough camber in the car. So I mean, it, 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 I can't tell you anything. I mean, once you get your tire temperatures and your pressures, that's the only way to do it. And we can we can certainly uh, fix you up with the stuff, including uh, tire mm-hmm. pressure, tire temperature sheets. I don't know if I've got one up here or not. Ah, I do. We've got these little uh, handy dandy tire temperature sheets that uh, we can get you fixed up with too. Uh, and if you want to know more, uh, just set up a fifteen minute consult. I mean, you sh- I do these 50-minute consults to help people with tech questions that might be a little more difficult to answer uh, in cars and coffee. Uh, so if you want to know more, you know, set up a 15-minute, and, and uh, kind of, I'll talk through it in more detail uh, to help you get your tire pressures. Okay, who's next? Okay, uh, so uh, again, uh, Kenny's answering questions live, so make sure you get your questions in. Uh, this is our next question. And it's from Kobe Ward. And I'll take this down after we read it. So Kobe Ward says, two weeks ago, you mentioned that you were re- uh, you removed the rear bump st- stops and bump stop brackets on your S197s. And rely on the bump stops and the coilover shocks. If you're not running coilover coilovers, what do you recommend to do with the rear bump stops? I have mine trimmed down to about one inch. Uh, okay, it depends on how much spring you're running in the back and what your, what your right height is. Uh, we just, the reason that I take them off is that what happens is when the car gets to a certain amount of roll, and if that bump stop makes contact with the frame, uh, no matter what size it is, if it makes contact with the frame, if you got soft springs, it's going to make contact. As soon as it makes contact with the springs, you have no suspension. Your suspension ceases to exist. And what happens is the car gets loose. It'll get, it's, it'll, and it'll get loose in a bad way. It's called snap over steer. So, I mean, if, if you're not if you're not getting onto, I mean, the best way to do it is just uh, how could you do that? See if you're getting onto. I think you probably could just maybe put some. I know what you could do. You could put some white paint on the frame, uh, and if you ever see and if you see witness marks of that bump stop hitting the frame, get rid of them. Um, because we run some, we run some pretty good spring rates, you know, on, on all of our track cars, and so I not only you know take the bump stop off, but there's the bracket that it sits on, hangs a little bit, hangs off the back of the axle. It sticks out a little bit. We whack that off too. So no chance of coming up and hitting the frame. But uh, that, that's my recommendation. Uh, if, if you're running, yeah, if, if you hit that bump stop, I mean, you're gone. You get snap oversteer, which is ne- never a good thing. But you can, you can kind of you know, do some, you know, put some paint or something on there to see if it's hitting. And if it is, just get rid of it. Uh, and if you're un- un- uh, if you're a little uh, unsure about that, you can always get some extra bump rubbers for your shocks. Uh, I mean, they're they're easily accessible. You can buy them just about anywhere, and they're they they would be a softer compression than hitting on the bump stop on on the axle. Okay, who's next? Okay, so if anybody, that was it for the questions. So if there's a last call for questions, so if you have any questions, please uh, post them right now. Um, also, I wanted to just recommend um, that we are going to be doing a couple evening workshops uh, in the next month or so, and I just want to kind of put this in your um, in the back of your head. We'll be doing an S197 
um, workshop on suspension workshop, and we will be doing another IRS uh, SN95 IRS slash uh, Fox body conversion uh, workshop. Those are about two hours long, and they'll be in the middle of the month on a Wednesday. So I will uh, we'll let you know a little bit more about that, Kenny. I bet this is the first time you've heard about this. I was going to just say this is news to me. I guess I got to put this in the back of my brain. Uh, what a surprise! <laughs> Oh, I love surprising you. So anyway, I'm gonna, we're going to wait a little minute for um, some questions because Facebook is um, runs a little bit behind the, the live that Kenny's on. It's about uh, 30 seconds behind. So we will wait a, a minute or two. Uh, the other thing we're working on is uh, we're in our fourth week coming up of the Speed Therapy Academy. And this week is uh, suspension and we're going to start going suspension into geometry. Yeah, yeah this, is, this is a good one. That Tuesday's going to be a really good one. Yeah. Well, last Tuesday, last last Tuesday was good. We still got into uh, suspension. Well, the week before we talked about sus types of suspension, suspension theory. Then we started talking about you know the whole the geometry thing. What is geometry, front and rear, and how do you calculate it? Now, now this Tuesday is the secret stuff that uh, you you can't download the, the PowerPoint from 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 this Tuesday because it's it's pretty good stuff. Yeah, so, you're going to share your secret sauce. So anyway, that's what's happening. Not all of it. Not, you got to hold some back. <laughs> so anyway, let me check to see if there's any questions coming through. No, we do not have any other questions. I guess everybody knows everything they need to know at this point. So um, Kenny, do you want to? Oh, what? wait, wait, wait. We did go on. Um, looks like Jim Flattery. Oh, he said the video and sounds gets interrupted regarding the bump star. Stop. He says, so if the car, here, I'll put this here. So if the car has a JRZ coil over, should he remove the bump stop? Oh, yeah, throw it away. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, because you're, you're running plenty of spring right back there. But you don't want, just, just in case, you don't want it to get on there. Uh, yeah, throw it away. And you could even, if, if, you're, if you're crafty, you could even cut that little bit back off, the little part that sticks out because... That's the next thing you would hit next with if you hit a really big bump. So, yep, we we, we never put we, uh, every single car we do it did not have any bump stops on the leaves. We used to, you know, shave them down, but then it just, you know, a couple of guys got snap over steer and they're not throwing them away. So, because it gives you an extra half inch of travel or so. So, okay. Here's the next question. Angie. Hi, Angie. Uh, Angie has a question. Kenny, do you have anything for late model uh, all-wheel drives show SHO Tauruses? Also, what would you suggest for miles uh, oil changes on a twin turbo car? Uh, unfortunately, I don't have anything. Uh, I'd love to drive one. Uh, but as far as, you know, oil changes on twin turbo car, I mean, you're running a lot of heat. You're going to want to run, obviously, good synthetic oil. It just kind of depends on how hard you're running it. Uh, and, you know, daily driver, you can pretty much follow the what the factory recommendation is. But if you do a track days with it, I think uh, maybe after two or three track days, I, I'd change oil uh, because you're going to be running at high, high pressure, high temperature. Um, and, you know, oil's cheap. Engines are expensive. So, but, uh, no, I mean, the new all-wheel drive uh, Taurus is, is, is pretty cool. Uh, we used to work a long time ago. We did we did some uh, zip up stuff for the original Tauruses uh, when they had the was it Yamaha Yamaha engine in it maybe uh, four valve. Uh, we we did some suspensions and brakes. We did all kinds of cool stuff. But haven't looked at the new ones yet. I mean, if somebody brought one in, I'd certainly take a look at it and try to figure out if anything could be done. Uh, there it always can be something done. But uh, no, nope, not yet. Just but if you're driving the car hard. Uh, on track days, you know, I would say at every two or two or three uh, events, I'd go ahead and change the oil, uh, just just because uh, heat heat is his heat is a killer. Okay, Cliff says if the car is tuned to octane of gas. Does that mean that the octane has to be used in the car? Oh, yes, uh, either that or higher, uh, because what happens if if you if it's tuned to like say uh, out here it's 93, I, I think on the west it's 91. If you got a car that's tuned to 93 octane and you were to put like 87 in, then there's a really good chance that it's gonna be too much timing and you're gonna pick up pre-detonation. So, I mean, it, it's, it's once the car is tuned to specific octane, you can go higher, but never lower. Uh, 
Uh, now, if it's tuned to, 90, tuned to 91 octane and you can get 93 or 94, no problem. Uh, you know, that, that's, that, going up doesn't hurt, going down does. Okay. Okay, Chris says for a supercharged car, 98 octane is fine. Yep, that, right. Uh, he's got a GT500, really cool GT500. Uh, and you can you know, look in your in your local, I was going to say phone book, you don't do it anymore. But you can look online for uh, local uh, Sunoco or VP uh, outlet. And uh, they've got uh, unleaded. If you've got a supercharged car, I mean, that's, I strongly recommend high octane supercharged cars on track just because of the heat. Uh, you know, the more heat, the more chances there are for pre-ignition. Uh, so, yeah, we can just, uh, you know, look for Snoco or VP, and both of them have like a, a 90. I think the, the Snoco is, is something GT, and it's like 98 unleaded. Uh, VP, I can't remember what their numbers are, but we use VP in World Challenge. Uh, they, they've got something in the same range. But, yeah, I strongly recommend supercharged turbocharge. It does not hurt to up the octane. It's just, again, insurance against pre-ignition especially on a hot day. So, okay, have we got anything else? Yep, oh. we have a number of questions here. Uh, so, Kobe Ward, do the Coney Yellows have internal bump stops? No, they got a bump stop on the outside, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I mean, it's been a long time since I worked with Coney. We used to use Coney Yellows, like, a lot back in the 90s. Uh, we couldn't get anything else. Uh, if you're talking about the rears, uh, what you can do is you can take take the, the rear shock. If you talk about the rear, push it all the way down and see what the length is. Okay, then put it in the car and then jack the axle up as far as it'll go. And if that number, and then measure again, if that number is is longer uh, than than the uh, uh, it's shorter than, than the expanded number, then you're fine. The other thing you can do is take a little zip tie and put it on the, the, the shaft of the shock, uh, and you put it down at the very bottom. And what's going to happen is that as the car works, that's going to work up. And you'll be able to see exactly how much travel there is uh, on that shock absorber. So, I mean, most of them have, gosh, it's been so long since I used Coney Yellows, but it is, it is a great shock. You know, I recommend it if, if you, you know, if, if it's more of a street car and uh, not a dedicated track car, and Coney Yellows, but uh, we've got actually... Uh, it's for 197s. You know, if you put Coney Yellows on, we actually have a kind of okay uh, spring setup. It's like a 325 front, which is about as high as you can get for off-the-shelf type shocks. But you couldn't use that on, on, a, on a standard shock because it overwhelmed the, the rebound. Uh, but, yeah, that's kind of like a lot of answers rolled into one. So, we got anything else, Carrie? Uh, yeah, we have another question. And again, this is a last call for any questions. Um, and we will answer this next one. And Kenny, you might get out of here early. You might be able to come home and do dishes and uh, do laundry. Yeah, I've, uh, Carrie's been uh, in bed for the last weeks. So yeah, one of my, one of my uh, chores today when I go home, I have to do laundry and clean the kitchen. And uh, I'm sure she'll come up plus run back and forth, bringing her water and snacks and, you know, uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, housemaid and nursemaid all wrapped into one. Okay, so I am, I am getting better. Okay, here we go. Here's for Nathan. Is it more advantageous to use a larger, taller ball joint or raise the inner pivot point of control arm for roll center and camber curve when lowering ride height? Uh, that's a really good question. And uh, if you're in the academy, you learn an awful lot about exactly what you're talking about. But here's the thing, when you when you lower a car, uh, I won't get into the, there's like a formula and it's geometry, you make a whole lot of lines and, and triangles and stuff to get the roll center. Uh, when you lower a car, the roll center will go down. And the roll center is the point that the car wants to roll around. And it's a geometric point that the car wants to roll around. If it's high, the car rolls around like a, like a, like a, like a, like a wagon. If it's low, it rolls around like a race car. It doesn't roll. Uh, so that's why we always, in, in like 197 suspensions, we bring the front roll center up because it, when you lower the front of a Mustang, the roll center you know, gets really low, like sometimes underground. Uh, and the back roll center on a stock Mustang is where the panel bar crosses center line of the car, and that's right in the middle of the axle. So, you know, you, you start, you, you connect the dots. One roll center is real high. One roll center is real low. So 
we're going around the corner. You go around the corner, the car is going to roll up in the back and down the front. But you can, you, if you drive around the corner hard in, in a stock Mustang, you feel the inside tire get light in the back. And all of a sudden, the front will start to push because that it's getting overwhelmed. Uh, so we want to bring the roll center up. The easiest way to do that is to get an extended shaft ball joint. I mean, that, that makes it a little easier uh, because what happens is, you know, you lower the car and the uh, set of controller, and since this is the ball joint out here and this is the chassis right here, as you lower the car, then this is this pointing down. So when we put a longer ball joint in, we sort of try to level it out. This is just in theory. You could raise the inner pickup points. That's a lot harder than using a ball joint. Uh, we, we've got extended ball joints for both S197s and SN95s. And on, on the 550 cars, I mean, they're, that's pretty good. I wouldn't mess with the 550 cars. They work pretty good as they are. So, yeah, extended ball joint. I would I'd strongly I'd recommend extended ball joint. Any car that's lowered, Mustang is lowered because that helped bring the front whole center up, which is too low, low to start with. <laughs> so if you really want to make your car handle, you know, my, my AGS 4.0 suspension system, there's only three components, rear grip kit, front grip kit, springs, and shocks. And the reason for that is everything is engineered as a system. Uh, in the back, every single component is engineered specifically to contribute positively to improving the rear geometry. And if you talk to anybody that's put on the rear grip kit on a Mustang, you know, they'll attest to that. And the front grip kit's the same, meaning the control arms and the, and the K member are engineered specifically to work together. Uh, so, yeah, it's... I do part. I don't. You know, we build parts, but we we sell systems uh, because there's there's nothing worse than than if you get your shocks here, your springs there, your panel bar there, your brackets there. Uh, you've got you know kind of a mishmash of, of products, which means you're you're on your own R and D program uh, to see how that works together. Well, the way I come up, that's why we do systems. Is no hassle in the work. You bolt the stuff on and go. Uh, I've done all the engineering, all the testing, so. But yeah, back to the answer question, ball joint is easier. And if you want to talk more about that, again, you know, set up a 15 minute consult. I'll be happy to talk to you about it. And, and we do offer them on the, our, the KennyBrown.com website too. So they're available for you there. I have a quick question, a little comment from Mark Hassenberg. Kenny, you don't need to feel bad. I get to clean the house. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I guess we're in the same boat. <laughs> So anyway, Mark's, Mark's a good friend do, of ours. You got to do what you got to do. You know, it's that, that saying, you know, happy happy wife, happy life is very, very true. So, but, but Mark, I think you get a trade-off of a, probably a really good dinner from Heather. So uh, it yeah. might be worth a trade-off. Okay, well, here's I, some. I, I clean the house and I cook, so. Well, yeah. right now. Yeah. Who, who uh, I, I, normally, the I, normally, I normally cook anyway. I normally do the, <laughs> Carrie does the cleaning and laundry and I do the, uh, the shopping and cooking, so it works which, out pretty good. Which is wonderful, and he's an incredible cook. So just I, I'm fed well. Okay, here is uh, Chris Melitu has a, another question. What setting do you put your washers on for Dell? <laughs> I'm sorry, Chris. I didn't read the question before. <laughs> he's asking you that. Kid. <laughs> I just turned the button. There's a little knob. You kind of can, can turn it from from here to there. And right now, I just got it set in the middle because that seems like the place to be. <laughs> but I know that if you turn it down, it is something something to do with with uh, uh, you know delicates. <laughs> I, mean, oh. I do we have these different soap. Oh, Chris, when I read the word washer, I was thinking like a, a washer on a nut and bolt. So <laughs> that that was good. So. Um, Here's another one from Calvin. I've heard you mention to remove the rear sway bar when running a padded bar. Does this still apply to the Fox body? Uh, no, we re re remove the rear sway bar when we use our rear grip kit. Okay, because the the geometry that's in we kind of I fix everything in the back with geometry. So the geometry that's in there, if you put a, a rear uh, sway bar on, you increase the roll stiffness, which just throws everything out the window and the car gets loose. So that's why we throw the the way on uh, and a panner bar and roll bar work in two different ways. The panner bar centers the axle. Now we used to do a panner bar on the SN95 and Fox cars, but it, they're they're a double splayed uh, rear control arms, which means it's self centering. Uh, we didn't use the panner bar to center the axle. We used the panner bar to bring the roll center down because actually we, we went over this in uh, in uh, Tuesday night in in the, in the academy that. The roll center of the back of a S95 Fox Mustang is like really high. It's above the axle. 
so we use the panner bar to bring that down below, uh, down to the bottom of the differential. Uh, so uh, no, the panner bar and, and uh, sway bar uh, do two different functions uh, for, for the TT for the TT4 uh, rear grip kit. We just throw it away because we don't need it. But anything else, you probably need to go spray bar. Okay. I think that's it. And Cliff added a nice little comment. So he said, I'm not supposed to worry you out too much. So any. <laughs> yeah, if that chance of that. <laughs> so. I, I, I've, got a, I've got a question for, for Chris Melitou, if you're out there. Uh, we need to have an idea for, for the seat in your car, uh, your height, whether you're long torso, short torso, long legs, short legs. Uh, so we, we get, you're not here to, to do a seat fitment. So we want to try to get it right the way this, the seat is right now. Uh, I'm, I'm only like five, eight, uh, and I can, I get with the seat all the way up. I, I sit pretty low, uh, but Kurt is like a big guy and it's perfect for him. So you need to get an idea of, of your build height and that sort of thing. So we can, we can work on getting the seat set up. So. And that is it. Okay. So good session, Kenny. Well, yeah, we will wrap up for today. Remember, send your send your questions in Speed Therapy Society if, if uh, you think of something during the week. Uh, also, uh, I'm available for the 15 minute consults. <clears throat> uh, if you got you know, questions, you want to do, want to learn about something, you got a tech question, you want to set up a build plan, uh, you know what what to do, what first, what second. Uh, you know, I'm available, uh, and even like all our guys that run uh, coilovers, you know, I'm available to help uh, do adjustments. <laughs> The first thing I ask it, if you've got one of our cars and you're on track or one of our suspensions are on track and you've got like, it's doing something, uh, the first thing I'm gonna ask for is gonna be tire temperatures. And because that's, once I know that the tire pressures and temperatures are right, then we do adjustments. I never make an adjustment on a car until I get the pressure set. Because I know that, that once the pressures are set, then, then that's the time to make adjustments. Because I mean, if, if you got too much air, uh, and the front end's pushing, you know, somebody might want to start changing shock adjustments when it's really tires. So, okay, with that, I think we'll wrap up for the day. Uh, like I say, it's a gorgeous day here, and I'm going to enjoy it on my way home, and I'm going to do laundry and clean the house. Oh, but okay. one, one, one thing. We, remember to get my Godiva chocolates. I'm binge-watching binge a, a series this, <laughs> this afternoon. So. Uh, that's not going to happen. <laughs> okay. So, have, have fun, guys. Okay. We well, appreciate you joining us today. And uh, uh, I guess we'll see you next week. I see the whole bunch of things going on over there. I don't know what's happening. But I got my the side of my screen moving. Whoa, it keeps moving again. Uh, okay. Uh, well, no more questions. Then I guess we're going to wrap up for the day. Uh, so we're gonna go out, I'm going to go out and enjoy the day. Um, I know what I'll do. I'll open the windows. Uh, open the windows, all the windows up while I'm doing the wash. That that should uh, that should give me some some outdoor stuff. So listen, we'll see you all next week. Uh, thanks for joining me again. Send your questions in or subjects. If you want me to talk about a specific subject, send send the in. We're always looking for ideas for cars and coffee on, on, on subjects for me to talk about. So with that, I'll say good day and everybody have a good time this weekend.